different concepts. As I mentioned earlier, if you're saying media, or social media even, media is not a theory. But if you want to um, talk about the relationship between concepts, for example, uh, media exposure over time, how that's going to affect people, then that can become a theory. That is how we have theories such as hypodermic needle theory and other theories such as uh, elaboration likelihood model and so on. Empirical level, on the other hand, is when we are doing the observation. Yeah? So this is the research aspect of this, yeah? which is the observation and of the of observation of reality. Now, it depends on what your training or interest is, then you will decide whether you want to do inductive and deductive. This is why it's very important for you not to decide from very early on. I have been told early, um, by Miss Olivia that the vast majority of you guys are uh, bachelor students. Some of you masters or maybe even uh, holding PhD or uh, pursuing PhD. So with that said, do not rush into saying, I want to do qualitative or quantitative. First decide, are you do, is your research inductive or deductive? Now, inductive means that your goal is to build the theory. Yeah? You don't have a theory at the beginning. Maybe you have some framework, but that's only the background. You don't, you're not supposed to start off with a theory. So your goal is to actually infer concepts so that they can, you can eventually be, uh, build a theory. Deductive, on the other hand, means that your goal is to test the theory. Yeah? So you, are, uh, you already have one or two theories that you want to test and then apply it to reality. Now keep in mind, however, that by testing, you don't necessarily test whether this is true or, or not. Because again, we are in social science. We're not in natural science in which, for example, E equals MC squared. Yeah? If that one time you prove that is not true, then the theory is canceled. In social science, we don't do that. So what you often do in your deductive research can be, for example, you want to refine a theory or improve a theory or maybe to update the theory that could be, for example, uh, mentioning hypodermic needle theory was a theory that was born in the times of the Cold War. Now it has been refined to today's times. Yeah? So that would be using the deductive research. After you decide whether you want to do inductive or deductive, meaning whether you want to build a theory or test a theory, then you can decide on the paradigm. Now, uh, the main paradigms of research, some may claim that there are others, but I would uh, focus on the two. Um, the main paradigms are positivist and interpretive. Yeah? Now, the term interpretive research is where a lot of people get it wrong, especially um, bachelor students. Yeah? So the term interpretive research is often loosely and synonym synonymously um, claimed to be qualitative research. However, these are not the same thing because when you're talking about interpretive versus positivist, you're talking about the paradigms, whereas when you're talking about qualitative versus quantitative, you're talking about data collection and how you're going to analyze it. Yeah. With that said, many of you, when you're saying qualitative research, most likely you are, you are referring to interpretive research. Now, interpretive research assumes that social reality is not singular. Instead, it's shaped by human experiences and social context. That is what is called ontology in social science. Therefore, it is best studied within the social historic context by reconciling the subjective interpretations of many people, in this case, the participants of your study. And this is the epistemology part of your uh, research. On the other hand, positivist or uh, often called functionalist paradigm, assumes that reality is actually independent of the context. Remember, uh, interpretive paradigm says that 
reality cannot be taken away or separated from the context. It is within the context. Whereas positivist research claims that, yes, you can take it out. So it's not subjective, it's actually objective. Whereas interpretive says that the truth is actually subjective. It depends on the experiences of people. Now, this, of course, because it is uh, going back to positivist, that means that it can be separated from the context, it can be abstracted from the context, and it can be sub uh, studied using um, standardized measurement tools and, and methods. Yeah? Now, as you can imagine, because the interpretive researchers assume that social reality is embedded within, and it cannot be separated, then they, the researchers, have to interpret the reality by making sense. Yeah, we call it sense making of by this process instead of testing a hypothesis. Now, this should also answer a lot of questions from many of, um, especially bachelor students. They often ask me, "Do I need a hypothesis when I'm using qualitative?" Okay, once again, we want to straighten up that many, many times you actually mean interpreting. But with that said, do you need a hypothesis? Because in interpretive research, you are actually trying to make sense of a reality over time, you do not need to test a hypothesis as you would do in uh, quantitative or positivist research. Yeah? I do have... Uh, experience though, I have read and I have met people who say, yes, you still use hypothesis, but instead of saying like H1 and H0, uh, no, you say just the statement saying that what, what your educated guess would be of the outcome of this research. Now, focusing on the interpretive research, because later on Ms. Uh, Sharon will focus on the quantitative or positivist one, then I want to mention about the characteristics that all interpretive research have to have. Yeah? The first one is naturalistic inquiry, which means that the social phenomena that is being studied has to be studied within the natural setting, which means we are not manipulating the setting. Yeah? We are not using independent variable or dependent variable like we are doing in experiments. We have to just study it within its natural setting and context. The second characteristic is that the researcher here is the instrument, yeah? which means that the researchers are often embedded within the social context that they are studying. Yeah? And they must use their observational skills, trust within the, with the participants, and the ability to extract information. The next uh, characteristic is interpretive analysis which means observation has to be interpreted through the eyes of the participant. Once again, participants, not the researcher. Yeah? So you have to be interpreting the data, and you have to be empathetic toward the participants, imagining that this, would, this is the reality of the participant, which means that you have to be clear of your biases or uh, preconceived notions of anything. And this is easier said than done. Um, and then the next characteristic is expressive language. As you may have experienced of, of this, um, a lot of our data is text, yeah? Oftentimes transcript from the interviews or maybe content analysis and so on. Now, this means that it's very important to document verbal and nonverbal language of participants. And the analysis of this language like for example, sarcasm or negative tone and so on is very essential. And then the temporal nature. Yeah? The temporal nature is another important characteristic. This is why I often discourage uh, bachelor students and even master students from doing interpretive study because the interpretive research actually seeks to make sense of the dynamic social process as it unfolds over time. So usually the researcher has to be in the site for an extended period of time. Now, if you only want to do this research for less than one semester, then you are advised not to choose this method, of course. And then um, hermeneutic 
uh, circle. I'm gonna be talking about hermeneutic after this, but why is it a circle? Because it means that you keep going back and forth. Yeah. Um, hermeneutic is the study of text. So what you are doing here when analyze, analyzing the data of interpretive research, uh, you are actually moving back and forth from the text, which is the data from your observation, and the context, which is the actual phenomenon that you are studying. So this continues over and over again until you reach theoretical saturation. What does that mean? Theoretical saturation means that you have reached a conclusion. Okay, so these are some of the types of scientific, these are sci uh, types of scientific research, descriptive research, comparative research, defining research, evaluative, explanatory or exploratory, predictive testing, framing, testing research. However, the main ones that are usually used are three, exploratory research, descriptive research, and explanatory research. Now, exploratory research is when you are oftentimes uh, trying to research about a new issue or a new area. Yeah? What you have to remember here is that the goals are, first one is you want to scope out how big or the magnitude of this phenomenon. For example, you want to um, study the phenomenon of TikTok, for example, or the phenomenon of working from home and so on. You want to see how vast this um, issue is. And then the second one, is that your goal is to in generate some initial ideas yeah because it's a new area then you want to get some new findings some uh, some initial findings and then the third one is that you want to test out the feas feasibility the possibility of you conducting further research on this topic so a good example would be for example right now we are in the period of um COVID 19. maybe you want to explore the level of general dissatisfaction faction of um, citizens of a certain country toward the governmental policies regarding the COVID-19. Now, um, the next one is descriptive research. Now, descriptive research is directed at making careful observation yeah, and detailed documentation of certain phenomenon based on scientific methods. Now, this is usually uh, when you want to paint a picture, for example, you want to describe the uh, student population of your university, then maybe you will find out, okay, turns out that 70% is male, 30% is female, and then 20% lives in uh, outside Jabodetabek, and then the rest lives in Jabodetabek, and so on. So you're actually trying to picture of the population. A good example of this would be the demographic study statistic by Census Bureau. And then finally, ex explanatory research. Explanatory research is similar to exploratory. However, you are trying to uh, connect the dots here. Yeah, You're trying to connect the dots and identify causal factors. Like for example, why do teenagers join violent gangs? Yeah? Or why do uh, kids become drug addicts and so on yeah so when you're doing this you are doing explanatory research okay now having talked about uh, the different types of research then we can move on to the qualitative and quantitative research now keep in mind guys we're probably skipping a lot of things obviously you would have to take at least one semester or two to learn about uh, research, research met methodology. Um, so yeah, qualitative versus quantitative. Many of you already know that um, qualitative relies on data that is non-numeric, yeah? whereas quantitative relies on data that is numeric. But please, please, please remember that when we are saying quantitative versus qualitative, we are talking about the type of data that we're going to collect and how we will analyze it. Yeah, so it will not be decided from early on. Miss, I want to do quantitative or qualitative. You have to first know what you are trying to find out. With that said, then I'm going to focus on the qualitative methods. Now, some 
methods that are used in um, interpretive research design? Well, actually, why qualitative? Because the vast majority of the methods you used in interpretive research design is qualitative indeed. Yeah. I'm going to give you another example of one uh, method that is highly um, misunderstood by people. Yeah, I get a lot of pieces and proposals saying that they want to do a case study. Yeah, be careful though. It can be a, indeed a case study, but when you are a, doing a case study, you have to remember that the case study, one, you have to have a case, of course, and then next is that it's actually intensive and longitudinal. It's not just you visit one company, you observe it, and that's it. Case study. That's not a case study. Yeah, the, it, it's an intensive longitudinal study that studies a phenomenon at one or more research sites for the purpose of deriving detailed, contextualized inferences and understanding the dynamic process underlying a phenomenon of interest. This will require oftentimes interviews. There are different types of case studies, yeah, that we're not going to go over today. But then it will require you to interview um, the, for example, the the key respondent, a key informant, sorry, key informant, and then the other informants, and then you would have to compare documents and so on. So please be very careful when you are deciding what type of method you claim to be using. Another um, example of a method used in interpretive research is action research. Now, action research is actually, sorry, action research is actually positivist, but uses qualitative. So it's a mix of both, yeah? Now, this actually aims at theory testing. That is why it's, um, th that is why it's actually uh, deductive. Yeah, so you are testing a theory ra rather than building the theory. In here, you as a researcher, probably either a student or co a consultant or a member of the organization, then you would be embedded within that setting. And what you do is usually when there's a problem arising, you want to fix it and you come up, you use a theory that you want to test it on its application. Meaning, for example, if um, a company wants to introduce new technology to increase uh, profitability, then the researcher will have to choose actions based on a, an existing theory. Yeah. Now, this theory will later on be validated if indeed that the claims of that theory is actually the same as the results that you find after applying that theory to reality. This is actually a very good method to bridging research and practice. Now, this is one method that I actually um, can suggest for master's and bachelor students. Yeah? So this is a good one. You have a theory and you want to apply it to reality. The next one is ethnography. Yeah? Ethnography is actually studying a phenomenon within the context of its culture. It's highly derived from um, anthropology in, because you are studying human beings uh, within their cultures. Now, the researcher has to be deeply embedded within that social culture, yeah? oftentimes years, yeah? Um, again, which is why you are not advised to do this if you want to finish your um, thesis or your research within one semester. Yeah? So what you have to do is Again, you are trying to make sense of the culture and of their, the realities of these people. Now, um, so the primary mode is a participant observation. You are embedded within that culture. And then um, with, when you are being embedded, then you would be taking extensive field notes. You would be uh, narrating experience. You would be making conclusions. You would be participating in their life. So a good example is Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall, if you have heard of her, she did a, a very extensive study with chimpanzees in Tanzania, yeah, in which she actually learned the language of chimpanzees. Now, this was done because she was actually living in the jungle for a long time. And then the next one is phenomenology. Phenomenology is a really good research method if you are doing a doctoral study. 
um, it emphasizes the study of conscious experiences. Yeah. Um, but first, you have to remember that researchers have to eliminate eliminate any prior assumptions and personal biases. Yeah. As I said earlier, it's easier said than done. You have to empathize with the participant situation and tune into existential dimension. Um, for example, you are using a systematic manner to reflect and analyze a phenomena, such as, for example, based on the experiences of people, like, uh, for example, their judgment, their perceptions, their actions. Now, the goal here is that you want to first appreciate and describe the reality of these people. And then the second, you want to understand the symbolic meaning. So in, in social science, we call it deep structure underlying these subjective experiences. Yeah. This would be a good research, for example, if you want to. Um, a few years ago, I did a research on um, identity negotiation of single mothers in Jakarta. Yeah. So I have to um, base my, uh, my interpretations on their realities on their explanations about their experiences as single mothers in Jakarta, their stigma, the stigma, the difficulties that they uh, experience, and so on. Now, the next one, after having decided on those methods, then you will have to decide how to analyze the data. Yeah, this is actually where people, what what people mean when I want to do qualitative or I want to do quantitative. Now, as you know, quantitative analysis will focus on numeric data. However, qualitative analysis does not depend on numbers. Actually, it, have, it is heavily dependent on the researcher's interpretation. That is why it's called researcher, uh, it's researcher dependent, yeah? because it analyzes the interpretation of the researchers. Now, the emphasis here is to, again, make sense and understand the phenomenon that uh, the researcher studied. Yeah? Obviously, there has to be a manner to this. Yeah? There has to be a method that is standardized. It has to be ethical, and it has to be um, a set of analytic strategies that can actually be redone. Now, some analysis um, methods include the first one, grounded theory. Now, this is another one that I would like to clarify. Yeah? I get a lot of thesis students who, who put in their chapter two, which is literature review. The title is Grounded Theory, uh, because they think that grounded theory just means that that is the theory that they are using for that thesis. But grounded theory is actually an analysis method. Yeah? So it is actually an inductive technique. Yeah? Inductive technique, which means you start from Zero. By zero, I mean like you don't have a theory that you are holding on to. You are actually basing your uh, interpretation or grounding your interpretation. That is why it's called grounded theory on your data, based on your observation, based on your uh, interviews and whatnot. Yeah. So the researchers here have to suspend any pre-existing theoretical expectation and biases before data analysis, let the data dictate the formulation of the theory. So I hope I make it clear, yeah? Grounded theory is not the theory that you are using for your thesis or for your research. Grounded theory is actually an inductive technique in which you actually start from no theory and after conducting the observations, aka the empirical research, then you come up, you decide what theory is best for this. Oh, yeah. And um, the way you will uh, analyze the data is through three stages of coding. Yeah. So imagine you have done in depth interviews, or you have that. Yeah. Usually it's done through in depth interviews. Doesn't have to be sometimes focus group discussions and so on. But let's say in depth interviews. Then you will have to transcribe the data, which is the, the, the you would usually record it and then type it. And I would usually start by making three uh, columns in, in on my paper, or you can use it on the computer. I'm just, I like to still use my hands and write write down my notes. So the first stage is open coding, which means 
you are reading your transcript and you are deciding on key ideas, but still general. After that, so you write down the notes, yeah? Open coding and then you come up with keywords or key ideas based on your research, uh, on your interviews. After that, you have to reread the transcript and this is where you are doing axial coding, which means you are already starting to make connections, yeah? You are trying to assemble causal relationships between different um, concepts that you have found. And then again, reread the whole thing again, and then you're doing selective coding, which means you are identifying the central category, which is the core variable yeah, of this, uh, of your finding. Now, finally, at the end, the theory has to be validated by comparing it with raw data. Yeah? And if indeed that theory contradicts the observation evidence, then you will have to uh, start the, uh, the coding process again. So as you can imagine, this is really tedious and rigorous work. Another um, analysis that you could do for uh, qualitative analysis that you could do is content analysis. Now, content analysis is another one that I do actually suggest for uh, bachelor and master students because it's, it's good, but it can be done within a shorter period of time. Yeah? Um, of course, depending on what your sample is. Now, this is a systematic analysis of text, of the content of text. Yeah? Um, so you want to, instead of, so what is different from uh, coding? Now, coding, you are conducting the research, the transcript of the interview, then you will code it and so on. Now, content analysis is already existing text. For example, um, news articles or, for example, blog entries and so on. And you are analyzing the content. Now, what you have to do is, the first one, the researcher has to begin by sampling, which means you are choosing which ones you want to include. Of course, if this is a big one, yeah? If you, if you only have three editions of a newspaper, then you, you don't have to sample, you can include all. But if you have to uh, sample, then do so. And this is not random, guys. This is actually based on the ones that you think most prominently um, represents your entire uh, your entire population now after that then you identify the rules that you wanna you that you wanna use on this research yeah this is called unitizing for example you only wanna uh, study the assumptions or you only want to see the effects or you want only want to see articles that are on the first page and so on so you are making the rules for this for what you are studying and then the third one is when you are constructing the concepts. Yeah? This is where you are coding. When you are coding, then you are, you're the one coming up with the schemes, of course. Yeah? Finally, the coded data is analyzed. When you are, for example, um, and by the way, often you are using quantitative and qualitative because sometimes, for example, you want to see uh, how many times the word, like, for example, if you want to, uh, research about COVID-19 and the anti-Chinese sentiments, and you, wa you want to see how many times does a newspaper call it the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus instead of COVID-19, then that would be numeric. So a good example uh, would be sentiment analysis. This is uh, the most common one and the easiest one, I think, in which you are just using a technique to capture whether the opinion of uh, a person or a medium is actually positive or negative and so on. Okay. Now, another one is the hermeneutic analysis. Yeah, also a, a method, a qualitative method. Now, hermeneutic, once again, is uh, the study of text. Yeah, so you are interpreting text. Now, what the difference is with the others is that here you're interpreting the text as your main um, subject or object of uh, research, and you have to actually understand the social historic of that text. Yeah? So you have to understand the context of that text. Unlike grounded theory, grounded theory usually uh, focuses on the coding process. Hermeneutic analysis really needs to interpret the technique in, um, and the social history here. For example, um, this actually derives from 
biblical studies in which people study the Bible and they want to find out, for example, um, let's just give the example of the book of Revelations by John, for example, in the Bible. If you are studying this, then you would be trying to find out what was life during his time. Uh, for example, what, what, how was he brought up? Why did he say this? Why did he say that? Yeah, this is often done when we are studying um, Bibles or any other scriptures. Yeah, if we want to find out, for example, um, let's say if we want to talk about polygamy. Is polygamy mandated by God or is it because of the cultural condition at that time? Now, if you are doing hermeneutic study, then you would actually be exploring the socio-cultural aspects. Now, in order to do this, of course, you don't have to do it fully um, manual, but there are some software programs, for example, uh, Atlantic, Atlas C5, NVivo, QDA Miner, and this can be used to automate coding process yeah, in qualitative research methods. Now, these programs can quickly and efficiently organize and process large volumes of text data you, uh, using user-defined rules. So you set the rules. However, um, it cannot decipher the meaning behind certain words, which is often important when you are doing qualitative analysis. Yeah, so uh, for example, sarcasm or slang words even, oftentimes they cannot de decipher it. I personally had a difficulty using NVivo because um, all my interviews were conducted bilingually. So oftentimes I cannot, the, the software does not um, detect uh, certain words and meanings. Now, if the coding schema is biased or incorrect, obviously the resulting analysis of the entire population can be flawed or cannot be interpreted. So this is difficult, yeah? All right, so I would like to hey, pass it on yeah, to Ms. Sharon uh, now. You may, okay. Okay, Sharon, can you pass the voice? Hi, uh, Sharon, can you try your voice? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sounds good? Yeah, thank you. Alice Clark. Yeah, okay, okay so, uh, then we... Right. Shall we continue? Okay, so hi everyone. Um, thank you, Budebi, for the first part, which is the interpretive approach. And now we're going to look into a positivist approach, yeah, which is mostly quantitative methods. Now, as you can see, we need we as like we as people who do a lot of quantitative studies, we really need to pay attention to our data collection methods and our data analysis techniques. Yeah, and these all derive from our hypothesis. Yeah, um, because we need to control. We need to make sure that everything is well controlled. Yeah because we are trying to use numbers and we're trying, with these numbers, we're trying to assume something and prove something, yeah? So everything needs to be in order, yeah? So that's why it's very rigorous when we're doing quantitative studies and there are a lot of rules and there are a lot of requirements when you're doing statistical analysis as well. Okay, so the aim for today, for this presentation at least, what is for me to point out the importance, yeah, of building your variables properly and also building your instruments. The other point I want to bring out in this presentation is also that you're getting the, you have to get the most out of your hypothesis because as I always say, your hypothesis is pretty much your recipe for your data collection and data analysis technique. Okay, so I'm going to continue. What are, what are quantitative methods? They're pretty much, you know, focus, it focuses on gathering data numerically and then generalizing it across groups of people to explain a particular phenomenon. Yeah, so we're using numbers, yeah, to represent to, on a sample and we rep that represents a whole population, okay? So that's what quantitative methods usually do. And what are their characteristics? Well, first of all, uh, it's not inductive, it's deductive, so it begins with theory, yeah? It's Deductive methods is the way we acquire our knowledge, yes. And the second part is we are falsifying an existing theory. So 
in the world, there's no such thing as absolute truth. Yeah, so the only way to prove something is correct is to prove that it is wrong. Therefore, when we are doing quantitative research, we always have an H1 and an H null. Yeah, because we're trying to prove that the null is, we're either re accepting the null or rejecting the null hypothesis. Okay, the third part is that it just, it generalizes knowledge. Yeah, so um, we're overgeneralizing. We're taking a small sample and saying that this sample represents the whole population. Okay, and thirdly, and uh, fourthly, it's prediction. Yeah, so that's why we have a hypothesis. A hypothesis helps us predict the effects that are currently happening. Quantitative research is also a way to give numbers to a certain phenomena, yeah? When, for example, you wanna look at the relationship between A and B, and we give it a number, so we know whether it's a higher relationship or a lower relationship, yeah? And the last part of the characteristics of quantitative research is that there is a standard measurement of instruments. I cannot um, stress this enough that in, because you are measuring using this instrument, you need to go through rigorous um, validity and reliability tests to make sure you are measuring what you want to measure. Yeah. Another aspect is that it's time. Yeah. So people don't have a lot of commitment to the research. Usually what they do is when they come in, your participants, they fill in the questionnaire. Yeah. And then they leave, you know, uh, for qual qualitative studies, you know, you have to sit there for maybe an hour and you're having a long discussion and you're talking, you're having a good in-depth interview. Now that takes a lot of commitment for your participants. But for quantitative studies, sometimes it's just, oh, please fill in my survey, I'll take 10 minutes, thank you, and then you have your results, yeah? And the last part is you, sh you need to have a large sample. Uh, for qualitative studies, maybe you could have three or four people, that would be enough, yeah? Or you could have seven people in a focus group discussion and that would be perfect. But for quantitative studies, you would need, let's say, more than 100, more than 100 people. For example, if you, let's take a look at a t-test, yeah? If you wanna do a t-test per group, for example, if you're comparing male and female, per group, you would need around 85 people as a minimum, yeah, with a probability level of 0.05. Let's say that, yeah. Then, yeah, you would need 85 participants per group. So, in total, you would need around 100 and 70. Okay, so what is the goal of quantitative research? Yeah, well, to be very, very clear, the main goal is pretty much to determine the relationship between one thing, which is an independent variable and another, which is a dependent variable, yeah, within a population, okay? And the beauty of social sciences and, your, and the beauty of doing quantitative research for social sciences is that you're trying to measure something that you cannot touch and that you cannot see, yeah? And that's what makes it very difficult. And that's why it's a lot more, it's about the quantitative research is a bit different compared to other subjects, yeah, okay. So, in quantitative research designs, there are two types. We have descriptive, yeah, and we have experimental. So for the descriptive, we usually have measure the subject once. So they fill in the questionnaire only once, yeah? And usually the descriptive um, designs look into associations between two variables, okay? Now, for experimental, you measure something before and you measure it afterwards, after a specific treatment, yeah? And then what you usually measure is causality. So how does... A cause B to happen, technically, yeah. All right, so here are pretty much the two different types. Here in communication studies, usually we say descriptive empirical research is a, is a form of a survey, yeah? And we have three types. We have observational descriptive surveys, we have content analysis. So yes, content analysis also appears in quantitative studies, not only qualitative. Yeah, 
It just depends on your approach. The third one are opinion surveys, okay? And as you can see in the bottom, there's three types of experimental research. I'm not going to really dive into it, but I will discuss it a bit, yeah? We have pre-experimental, quasi-experimental, and true experimental. Okay, so here for observational descriptive surveys, yeah, well, it's, it's a survey that pretty much describes the current situation. Okay, so the variables are not manipulated by the researchers, yeah, though the methods of making observations and measurements may be fully controlled, yeah. So, for example, on that survey, you are measuring their level of happiness, yeah, and that would measure their current state of happiness, you know, because you're describing their current state, okay. The next is content analysis. So, Content analysis is used to describe and systematically analyze the content of written, spoken, pictorial communication. So it could be newspapers, uh, TV ads, yeah. And what you do is you count the, the frequencies or the extent of various characteristics of a message. For example, you want, you want to figure out the number of times President Trump has said fake news on TV. Yeah, that's an example because you can count how many times he's he said fake news on TV. So that's an that's a very tiny example of what content analysis for quantitative studies looks like. Another one, which is a much better picture, would be uh, if you compared how Compass Detik, and Compass and Detik, yeah, how they frame the government's decisions in dealing with Corona. So maybe you gather all the news articles from January till today, and then you go through every single article, and then you jot down whether or not Compass is giving a more positive review of the government's decision dealing with corona or a more negative review, yeah? So these are, these are examples of how to use content analysis, but of course it would be a lot bigger in the sense, yeah, if you're going to use it for your master thesis or your bachelor thesis. The last one is opinion surveys, yeah, because here in communication and public relations, um, opi public opinion is a very big deal, yeah, and opinion surveys are designed to identify how groups of people report their evaluations on various topics, yeah, I hope that's very clear. So I'm going to continue onwards to the different types of experimental research. Now, um, first you start with pre-experimental, yeah? So it means that you have the basic experiment steps, you have pre-test, treatment, and then post-test. Now, to make this a little more clear for you all, I had a bachelor student, and what she did was she measured the direct, so the direct effect, yeah, of violent movies on the level of aggression amongst teenagers, okay? So what she did, since she's measuring the level of aggression, she had a pretest and in the pretest people up at, it measured the current state of aggression yeah and then and then she went through the treatment which was watching a violent movie okay and then after that was the post test which is asking the teenagers how they felt so their current level of aggression after watching okay so those are the different steps in, an ex in a pre-experimental design, yeah? The next part is quasi-experimental, okay? So yes, you have pre-test, treatment, and post-test, but the difference is, is that there is a control group. So control group means that this group does not watch violent movies, but it watches something else that does not stimu stimulate violent actions, okay? And the last one, so true experimental group, means that, you know, you have a control group, you have the treatment group, and everything is random. So every single person has the chance to either, has the chance to be in the control group or in the treatment group. Yeah, so there's a lot of randomization, and that's what a true experiment looks like, or a true experimental study looks like. 
Okay. But anyway, the whole point of our, our communi in communication studies or in quantitative research is that you want to look at the relationships between independent and dependent variables within a population. So people who are still around, and if you can hear me, why don't we try to do something a little more interactive, okay? First thing I want you to remember is first you need to know how to measure your variables, yeah? Second is you need to know how to build your variables. And third, you need to be able to operationalize them in quantitative research. Let's say I have a research question, okay? You guys can reply this in the chat. I can read the chat, by the way. So, how does social media influence our self-esteem? Could anybody tell me what the independent and dependent variables are of this question? So, how does social media yeah, influence our self-esteem? Which one would be the independent variable and which one would be the dependent variable? Ah, oh, excellent. I like this already. So, yes, you are right. Social media is the independent variable and self-esteem is the dependent variable. Yeah. So, the next step is how do I measure social media? Okay. So, because... Like I said, it's not something you can um, touch or or feel or see. You know, it's something that you have to, something that you have to measure. How do you measure social media, right? That's the beauty of studying in a field where nothing you cannot touch anything. Yeah. So, how do you measure social media? Yes, by a questionnaire. But remember, let's like what kind of yes, definitely with a questionnaire. But how are you going to measure it? So in the questionnaire, what are you going to write? Okay, social media measured by the perception of the user. Okay, media monitoring, observation, can be, can be. So if I were to write a questionnaire, yeah, because we know social media, we know that social media, there are different types of platforms. We have Facebook, we have Instagram, we have YouTube, we have TikTok, right? That's a lot, okay? But how do we measure it? Okay, uh, yeah, with this, yes, definitely with a scale. Did someone write frequency there? Yes, with frequency, very good. So first you go through your literature review and you look at previous studies, yeah, theories, dissertations, and you think about how am I measuring my variables? So how am I gonna measure social media and how am I gonna measure self-esteem? Because it needs to be a verb in there, it needs to be an action in there, yeah? So one way to do it is to measure people's exposure to different types of media, okay? Exposure. So to measure social media, you measure how long have they spent using social media, yeah? Exposure. How long have they been exposed to it, okay? So that's one way of building your um, variables, yeah? Yeah. The second one is self-esteem. So because um, we're doing the seminar and you can't really Google, I found one where for self-esteem by Washington from 1991 said that there are four dimensions yeah, to self-esteem. Exactly. There are four dimensions to self-esteem. So it means you need to be able to use these four dimensions to measure self-esteem. Okay? And yeah, so I just want to tell you significance. What does significance mean? Significance means feeling that you matter to someone. Yeah. Competence means how skilled am I or how useful am I? Yeah. Third is power, which is control of being who you are. Yeah. And the fourth is virtue. Am I a good question? Am I a good person? Yeah. Do people see me as a good person? Yeah. So if you were going to ask, in the questionnaire, what would the question look like? Let's start with exposure. How would the question look like, guys? Oh, 
Okay, since um, we're kind of like running out of time, I will continue, yeah? So how would you measure? So how would you measure? Yes, oh, this is excellent. Great, so because we're measuring exposure, you would want to ask a question like, how often do you use Instagram or how often do you use YouTube? Yeah, one meaning never, seven meaning always, yeah? Okay, so if I am a person answering that question and I answer seven, what kind of person am I? I'll repeat. If I answer seven, yeah, what kind of person am I? See, this is a perfect example of you need to know every single item in your questionnaire. You need to know exactly what it means, yeah, what the data means. So if I say seven, it means I am, I have a high exposure to different types of media. So I have, a ex high, I have a high exposure to social media. Okay, yes, I am active, exactly. All right, exactly, very good. So the second one is self-esteem. How do you think I would build my question to measure significance? So feeling that you matter to someone. I'll continue because this is a tough one. So you would ask the question more like this. How well do you how well do these questions apply to you? Question number 1. Is it important for me? It is important for me to feel that I matter to someone. 1 strongly disagree, 5 strongly agree. So that when someone answers, yeah? When someone answers 1, it means that they have a low level of significance within self-esteem, yeah? So these are things that I want you all to start thinking about when you're doing quantitative studies is, what do my variables mean, yeah? And if someone answers seven or one, what does it mean, yeah? Okay, so here we are, yeah? Low and high exposure, yeah? If more people answer one, closer to one, it means people have a low exposure to social media, yeah? And here on the other side, if, you, if people answer closer to seven, people have a high level of significance, yeah? And you don't only do this for significance, you do it for all the other different um, dimensions, yeah? And if you find the average of all of them, yeah? So if you find the, the oh, okay, okay, no. So if you find the average of all of them, it would mean that it would end up being the level of self-esteem. So there would be low level of self-esteem or high level of self-esteem, okay? So based on this, you can already have an idea of what your potential hypothesis looks like, yeah? Just by doing something as simple as this. Yeah, your first hypothesis could look like this. Exposure to social media influences self-esteem, yeah? So, and the second one would look like High exposure of Instagram influences self-esteem, yeah? And the last one, it's getting exciting now. <laughs> those exposed to Instagram more have a lower level of self-esteem than those exposed to YouTube, okay? okay? So these are pretty good hypothesis because they tell you what the relationship is, yeah? So hypothesis number one, Exposure to social media influences self-esteem. So what are you measuring? You're measuring the overall level of exposure, yeah, and how that influences the overall level of self-esteem, which is significance, competence, power, and virtue averaged out. Is that clear? The second one is high exposure of Instagram influences self-esteem. So it means you are looking at only Instagram. So how does the level of exposure to Instagram influence our level of self-esteem? Yeah, as a whole, yeah. And last but not least is a comparison, yeah. Those exposed to Instagram, yeah, have a lower level of self-esteem than those exposed to YouTube. 
That's also an interesting study. And you can get even crazier and you can measure how the level of exposure influences every single dimension of self-esteem. That's when it gets exciting. Okay, so here, the main point is I want to show you is if you have a good hypothesis, if you have a clear hypothesis, it is the recipe for your data analysis, yeah? So one thing, one skill that I want you all to leave here with is to know how to identify a hypothesis, whether it's an association hypothesis or a difference hypothesis. I don't think we will have time to discuss directional and non-directional, but maybe you can, uh, we can send, you can send me an email or what, or you can ask later on further in the question and answer. So first we have association hypothesis, yeah? They look like this. There is a relationship between X and Y, yeah? X influences Y, or the higher X, the lower Y will be. Yeah, so your question will look like celebrity brand ambassadors increase our willingness to buy. Yeah, so the question now is what test would you do? What statistical test would you do to answer this question? You could do regression, yes, but since it's very simple, you can start with a Pearson correlation, or you can start with a, a Spearman correlation, yeah? Because this, this is the recipe for an association hypothesis. So usually hypothesis, so usually association hypothesis looks like this. It leads to either correlation or regression. But mostly regression hypothesis, uh, Roy, usually what it looks like is how does A, how is A a predictor of B, yeah? Because regression mostly, because you're looking for a linear, um, yeah, you're looking for a linear, uh, let's say a linear graph, yeah. That's why. Is A a predictor of B? Now, that is a proper regression question. Yeah, this is association, so it's still light. Now, here we're looking at difference. X is higher than Y, or there is a difference between X and Y. So, people who smoke are friendlier than people who do not. So, what test would you use? Anyone? Yes, you would be using a t-test because you are comparing two things. You're comparing two groups, yeah? You're comparing people who smoke and people who don't smoke in regards to their friendliness, yeah? And if you have three more groups, then you do an ANOVA, okay? So for this one, I would be doing a correlation test, yeah? And for the third one, I would be doing a t-test, yeah? So I hope you all remember your level of measurement, yeah, because your lectures did not drill you just to forget the level of measurements. Because in quantitative studies, it's very important to know them, yeah, because they are prerequisites to the test that you have to do, okay? So if you wanted to do a correlation test, here, Pearson correlation, then you have to make sure that your independent variable and your dependent variable are all in interval form. Is that clear? So don't forget to measure, don't forget to build, don't forget to operationalize your variables so that they're they are very clear, yeah? Okay, so a next th the next thing I wanted to discuss, oh, I'm looking at the time. Okay, the next thing I want to discuss is mixed methodology, yeah? Um, mixed methodology means you use both quantitative and qualitative methods, yeah? So the first one is called sequential explanatory design, which you start with a quantitative study and then you, which follows up to a qualitative study that leads to your interpretation. Yeah. So usually, for example, you would start with a quantitative study and the results are that, for example, women believe in fake news more than men. Yeah. For example, then you want to find out why. Oh, how is this possible? OK, then you do a qualitative study to dive in further and have interviews with women and really dig deep and find out, okay, how is this possible? You know, how is this phenomenon possible that women believe in fake news more than men? Yeah. So we use the qualitative results to assist in explaining and interpreting the findings of our quantitative study. 
The second one is sequential exploratory design. Yeah. So here we're using qualitative first in the first phase, and then it helps build onto the quantitative phase and then leads to our interpretation. Yeah. So to explore a phenomenon, uh, this strategy may be useful when developing and testing a new instrument. For example, for my um, master degree, I used a I used this design because there were not a lot of previous studies to help me build my questionnaire. Therefore, I had to start with qualitative, yeah, so that I had good proper instruments, then move to quantitative. Uh, last but I mean, there are more, but this is the third most common one, which is called concurrent triangulation, yeah, where you have where you do quantitative and qualitative research together at the exact same time and on the exact same topic. And what you do in the end is that you combine and compare the results during your inter interpretation. Yeah. So the advantages of quantitative are, you know, talking about the trends and the, the generalizations that you have. And then with the qualitative, you have the more in-depth um, ideas and details that you have found. Yeah. And you validate your quantitative findings with your qualitative data. So that's how you, they work harmoniously. Yeah. So we have finally made it to our conclusion. Perhaps the most important issue to consider is what are you specifically trying to learn about your topic? How are the concepts variables in your topic are related to each other? Yeah. Do you want to see the different do you want to see the differences between specific groups of people on a variable of interest? Then these are probably quantitative, that's more of a quantitative focus. But if you want to know how phenomenon happens, thoughts, feelings, and experiences of people regarding your topic, then you should probably do a qualitative study. Yeah. Another thing to consider, oh, another thing to consider is, is which study is most feasible for you to conduct? Yeah. So if it's a quantitative, if it's quantitative, it's easier to conduct, you know, but you require a lot of participants. Yeah, there's less time commitment for the participants. You really need to focus on building, measuring and operationalizing, operationalizing your variables. Then you have your data analysis that can be conducted very quickly if you know what tests to do. And then if you want to do qualitative, then you have in, it's intensive and time consuming yeah so you have fewer but you have fewer participants yeah you have in-depth interviews you have interview guidelines then you need to transcribe you need to review and then you need to code and then interpret yeah so it is time consuming to that extent so i hope that in the end what matters is what research method should I use? Yeah, you should follow your research goal and what do you all want to achieve? Yeah, the second is what make sure and really think about whether or not your study. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, uh, Debbie. So, yeah, uh, now uh, we are starting our question and answer session. So, we already have some questions from the participants, but or you can also put I uh, still cast your questions in the question box okay so I'm gonna read the first questions that already come from the participants so uh, he or she asked about the that temporal nature is one of the research that can measure social phenomenon in that amount on of such a short period of time do you think it will be hard to find the theories related to those phenomenon, especially uh, when the the phenomena is like new in the society? Maybe Debbie can answer about it. Uh, Olivia. So yeah, if for example you are um, now the important part about interpretive research is that you are actually. Um, trying to make sense of how the dynamics of this social phenomenon um, happens over time. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you you have to study it for ages. If, for instance, you want to study, like do a content analysis 
on for example the shifting of the i i have advice i have been an advice advisor for a thesis student for she was doing a research on the shifting of the idea of beauty over time from a certain um, magazine i think or a newspaper so what she did was actually she ex, uh, she analyzed um, this newspaper i think it was a newspaper newspaper from the 70s until the 2000s and then she was actually searching um, advertisements portraying women with the assumption that the women portrayed in advertisements are women who are considered beautiful so she was able to see within a semester the shift of uh, before for example in the 70s women who are beautiful were portrayed as very motherly very nurturing and so on and then in the 80s there were like uh, the shift was toward be, uh, becoming professionals and a beautiful woman was a person who or was a woman who is uh, nurturing but at the same time has a career but the career was very limited at that time so women were portrayed as secretaries or flight attendants or nurses and then eventually in the 90s and then the 2000s it changed now this was done within a shorter period of time and was there a temporal value absolutely she was able to see this and how it turns over time now if you are talking about a, a for example a new issue now it depends if you're talking about like um covid 19 um i i i would say that this is such a new issue that uh, we cannot do an interpretive study just yet yeah so please don't get it wrong i'm not talking about you having to spend ages doing this study but within that study you have to be able to see how it um evolves over time if you are able to do that for example with the content analysis or a semiotic analysis then the temporal value is there does that make it clear Okay, I think I it's so. <laughs> yeah because I received some uh, message that say yeah it's clear. Okay, so moving on to the next question that already comes to us. Okay, is hermeneutic analysis same with the critical discourse analysis? Hmm. Uh, I have read both. I have read both. In my opinion, it's very similar, yeah. Because both, for example, if it's a discourse and you put it into text, then it becomes hermeneutic. Now, however, a very important difference between these two are usually the fact that um, critical discourse analysis is usually a political, it, it, it's a politics research in which usually it's a um, political project in which a person takes a position and does research on this both actually studies the text and both actually have to study the um what do you call it uh the social historic value of this however in hermeneutic it doesn't always uh involve the intratextual aspect which means for example if you are studying the bible and you are um, trying to do a hermeneutic study on the books of Revelation, you are not required to search other texts about this. You just have to focus on that uh, specific text and try to understand the historical issues during that time and who the writer was and what he was thinking and cultural values and so on. Yeah. But usually the crit critical discourse, because critical discourse analysis is a cultural study, um usually you would have to involve the intertextual aspect in which you would have to study other texts as well but again some may also argue that yeah you can do that for hermeneutics but you don't have to so i think that the most uh, the biggest difference here is that usually a uh, critical discourse is done for uh, as a political project and hermeneutics not necessarily but i think that the two are very similar by the way i may be wrong I keep reading different things um, in different books. So yeah, I, I w again, I would say the, the two are very similar with um, some issues like it doesn't require intertextual aspect and that usually CDA is used for political projects. 
Okay, thank you Debbie and this is an interesting question uh, so yeah uh, they ask uh, whether uh, is it a must for a quantitative research to have a hypothesis or a qualitative research can also have a hypothesis I think this goes to Sharon <laughs> I think well most definitely for quantitative research since you are looking if you're doing a proper research yeah not not um, just wanting to find answers yeah and wanting to look into the data on what you find it's very if you're doing a research that you want to publish a journal or something like that yes you need to start with a hypothesis because um, your hypothesis just can't come out of thin air yeah it needs to be backed up with it needs to be backed up with um, literature review yeah a thorough literature review because or previous studies that say that this might occur, yeah? So in quantitative studies, you need to have a hypothesis. And you, of course, you want to test something, right? You need to test something. If not, then you're just going in there blind, you know, if you don't have a hypothesis. So for quantitative studies, it is a must that you have. Okay, thank you. And how about uh, for uh, qualitative, what can uh, what's similar to uh, what is it called uh, to to the hypothesis that can be measured from qualitative for qualitative if yeah. what should occur what 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 would happen would be that they would ask how for example um, how is how is this achieved yeah so that would be a question but it wouldn't be a hypothesis because you are not giving a prediction. Remember, remember when it when it comes to a positivist approach, yeah, you start you are more predicting than you are um, finding out how things go. Yeah, that's the difference between a positivist approach and a um, interpretive approach. Yeah, so for qualitative, it's it's much better to leave your questions very open. So how is this achieved instead of why is or why is this happening? Yeah. For quantitative, it's this influences this. A influences B. A impacts B. Yeah. For qualitative, you are you are very much describing. Okay. I think that's I hope that answered your question. Okay. Thank you. So I think, uh, yeah, we should move to the next question that's already comes to us. So, uh, okay. In grounded theory, one of the data source is secondary data source, such as publication from, uh, for example, a statistic office, a statistic bureau, or like. Uh, Central Bank of Indonesia data is mostly numerical data. Is it still considered as qualitative? Um, now remember but that when we're talking about research, we we have primary and secondary, right? So when we are conduct, so um, researching from existing data would be considered secondary data. You can still, for example, study. Now, of course, I'm in communication, and usually most of my research would be con considered um, primary, and then I would be involving also secondary data. I understand, however, there are some other fields in which, for example, if you're studying banking, finance, or maybe even um, law, then you would not be doing primary data. Instead, you would be using existing um existing um, data so that would be considered primary uh, sorry secondary data can you still be doing grounded theory I uh, I say that if you have enough observation enough data enough notes then yes but keep in mind however usually grounded theory is not only does not only involve one source yeah that's very important usually you would be comparing like for example you have observation you have the interviews you have documents and so on and then from all those you come up with the right theory so again usually even if you are doing a law in which you are studying existing um, 
legal regulations, usually you would not be relying on one source only. You would be doing some interviews with, you would be doing other things so that eventually you can come up with the most suitable theory. But definitely, all research that we do, definitely we will involve secondary data. It's almost impossible for somebody to really start from scratch and not having existing. Um, and this is um, the existence of secondary data will also help us determine whether one we want to do explanatory, exploratory, or descriptive. For example, if we want to, if it's a new thing and there's not a lot of data out there, then probably we're gonna do first exploratory, right? We cannot connect the dots just yet. We can only explore. But later on, after having all these existing findings, then eventually you can do um, explanatory in which you can find the causal factors. What causes this? Why there's a economic res recession and blah, blah, blah. Okay, thank you. And yeah, maybe looking at the time, maybe we took two last questions. Is that okay? And maybe uh, for those questions who has not been answered, you can contact our speakers directly through email or yeah. So okay, so I will take two last questions. So yeah, uh, one question, one of the questions that um came to us today is about mixed method. So uh, mo uh, some people ask, uh, in what composition would we claim our study to be a mixed method? Uh, does it have to be the same proportion, for example, and then like, uh, and how can you uh, conclude that you uh, say that your uh, research is mixed method using the mixed method? something like that mixed method uh, uh, method and then uh, yeah mm, and okay and also uh, if for example like uh, a person doing a research and first one they he or she wanted to do a quantitative research and then suddenly um, yeah, it has a problem with uh, data collecting uh, and then sample collection, and then uh, then he or she decide to choose a focus group discussion, which is a more qualitative approach. Uh, is it possible to change as well, and then how or can we combine it into a mixed method, something like that? Okay, maybe uh, can be answered. Okay, uh, I hear that there were two questions, right? Um, okay. Yeah. Maybe we should maybe we should start with the first one. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yes. yes uh, okay. First, we can hear you. Because I can't read the question bar here. It's very small. <laughs> okay. Could you repeat? That okay. First? Thank okay. you. Uh, can, how can we say that our uh, research is using mixed method? Okay. Well, it's first of all, you should start with: Is there, for example, if you ha have a very, if you have a topic, and the topic is, um, let's say, the topic is not very, it's it's very rare, and not so many people talk about it. Yeah and not so many people have researched about it. So it means you lack the initial stages of, or the initial information and data of the specific topic. For example, my topic is usually on third culture individuals. Now, a long time ago in 2004, well, 2010, or two, yeah, in 2010, not so many people were talking about third culture kids. Yeah. So it means that you, I had to really do extensive qualitative research first. Yeah. So if, for example, you you don't have the characteristics, you don't have the dimensions for your independent and dependent variables when you when you're aiming to do a quanti quantitative one, then it is best you start with a qualitative study. Yeah, and so 
while you are trying to answer your quantitative hypothesis and you f figure out that you have to do a qualitative study before, that is already a mixed method because you are starting, you started with a quantitative, then realized you need, you need to have a structure. Yeah, you need to have your measurements, you need to have your, your instruments, and you need to have um, pre-existing information on your topic. Therefore, then you start with qualitative. Then you start doing interviews and questions. And when you transcribe and when you start coding, and your results should start forming into, let's say, a possible questionnaire. Now, that is an example where even though you started with a quantitative, but you ended up doing a qualitative first, that is still an example of mixed method. So you started with a quantitative, but to answer your quantitative hypothesis, you need to do a qualitative in-depth interview, then that's mixed method, yeah. Okay, and how about if we would like to change our method in the middle of our research? Is it, uh, is it possible or can we combine, combine it? Like I said before, with mixed methodology, it really depends on your aim, yeah. Uh, like what I mentioned previously, that when I said that, oh, you, if you start with a quantitative study, but then you realize, oh, you need to have data first of a qualitative study, then it's, it's possible you can do it halfway, yeah. And it means that when you started your quantitative study, yeah, it kind of, and it didn't, your, your question, you weren't able to build your questionnaire, yeah, then it's a, it's a big sign that your, the question or your specific topic should have been a qualitative study, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. And then, we, yeah, so before we move to the mm, uh, final remark for from both of you, from our speaker, so we will take one last question. And the question is, if we prepare two complementary papers that will be part of our research, and how we should uh, classify our research design? Uh, a mixed method approach or qualitative or quantitative approach will be better. So it's a multiple case study and later, uh, multiple case study and the later a survey. Okay, uh, it depends on what the aim of the multi, like back again, what is the aim of doing first the multiple, what's that called, the, the discussion or and yeah. then doing the survey? Okay. What is the aim? Yeah. Are you going? Are you going to use? Um, is for example the discussion? You're going to use the discussion, and then test out whether or not everybody has the same idea with a larger sample from that discussion. Yeah. See, so then that would be a mixed method. You that would be a sequential. Um, that would be a sequential explanatory design because you're explaining. Okay, so yeah, so I think uh, that's our last question for today. Uh, so maybe uh, both of you can give your final remark uh, for today's webinar before we are uh, closing this. Do we put the webcam back on, or? You may use the webcam again. <laughs> Are you doing it? If not, I'm not going to do it. No, it's uh, me as Egal. OK, I'll be doing it. <laughs> OK. So um, I'll start my remarks, uh, Budebi. Well, I hope that you guys, um, we've answered some of your questions in regards to mixed methodology, in regards to um, quantitative designs and qualitative designs. I see that there were a lot of questions that you guys yeah. have made and have written and we couldn't get through. But I, like I said, these are, and they're all very, very good. Yeah. Um, and thank you all again for hearing us. And if you have any questions, you can please feel free to 
contact me. Um, I think I'll give uh, Oli my contacts and you can ask her later for it as well. Yeah. Thank you again. And maybe uh, and for me, me, I thank you all for yeah. Thank you all for um, participating in the in this um, in this webinar. And I see again, like Sharon, I saw a lot of questions that have been mis uh, that have not been answered. You are welcome to email me with your questions. I'm really happy to see that it turns out that. Uh, not only do we have a bachelor student, but we also even have people who are uh, preparing their doctoral proposal. And so, I yeah, that's to me, impressive. this is where uh, what I discussed about the qualitative uh, and interpretive method is more relevant. So, yeah, please, um, you are welcome to email me, and hopefully, I can answer your questions. And I wish you good luck with your research. Okay. Yeah. Turns really out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Turns out we also have some PhD. Uh, yeah. Some uh, some people who wants to pursue their PhD and currently working on their research proposal. So yeah, it look at dear the endowment. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, thank you everyone for joining our webinar today, and especially thank you for. Uh, De Miss, uh, Miss, Mrs. Deborah and then also Mrs. Sharon for uh, yeah your really in interesting presentation like your complete presentation and it's I'm sure everyone who is joining the webinar will like give a lot uh, will have a lot of new information about especially about uh, research method so yeah uh, I will uh, so if you have more questions for uh, Miss Sharon and Mrs. Deborah, maybe uh, both of you can type your question, uh, your email in the chat box, so they can also send you email if they have further question. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, please. Uh, yeah, you can contact them as they said. And yeah, thank you very much. And see you at our next webinar. See you guys. And stay Bye. safe. Bye. Stay safe. <laughs>